Look at this. Underneath here is the Hathor cow, and she dominates the lower two-thirds. She's the feminine part. This is the earthly. These are the four sons of Horus, according to Joseph Smith and according to the ancient Egyptians. These represent the four quarters of what? The earth. But in the upper section here, up above this middle line here, we have the main deity, the creator deity, with the baboons, with the with the uh, lunar crowns on their heads, and up here we have Ammon, the hidden one. And look, he's in the top third. And then, of course, the, the sun god Ray in his boat, and this boat symbolizes the, the heavenly ascent, the expanse, the cosmos. You see, the upper part is basically male, while the lower part of the facsimiles are female, as a general rule. Now, it's very interesting, because in this regard, uh... Our bird-like figure. And you notice something else? This doesn't really look like a bird body. You know, they say it's a bird, but is it? It might have been just an incomplete serpent. Joseph Smith may not have just completed the serpent. But he got the bird head right, according to the other ones that I've showed you. But uh, this is potentially a female figure. This one, now this is male, obviously. Uh, some have argued this is the ithophallic deity, men. There's, there's other uh, hypocephali that show that the serpent is ithophallic. The point is ithophallic, male sex organ. <laughs> the point is, it's about generation. When you combine the male and the female, now look at this, the whole circle, the whole circle unites the male elements with the female elements. They are united in one eternal round as a general huge cosmological map. Everything is in opposites. I mean, this reminds you of Lehi's discourse. You know, there must be an opposition in all things. Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, said, in the field of space and time, the fundamental reality in the myths is opposites. Light and dark. This is the dark underworld. This is the heavenly light, the solar crown, the lunar, the moon, the sun. The upper half is light, dark. You combine the two, day and night, day and night. See, this is the circuit of the sun god Ray in his boat. Yes, even this figure is female and male on a smaller scale within the larger scale of male-female. Why? Because it's about generation. It's about eternal lives. It's the grand key words of the priesthood, just like Joseph Smith said. It is the Father in the form of a dove. Let me share something cool with you on that. Again, this is the Henry Mirror. This is the hypocephalus from Thebes. Again, you see this snake-like figure? Now, see, this is opposite from the Joseph Smith. It's the snake-like figure that's ithophallic, that has the male erect member, and this figure doesn't. So, this perhaps could be the male-female combined. In Egyptian thought, it didn't bother them to combine the sexes in one figure. Not at all. That's, that's very well known in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Chapter, or spell 163, as Raymond Faulkner showed, had an ithophallic female deity. She had breasts, but she was also ithophallic. Check that out if you can. It's interesting. But here again, the cow, the Hathor cow. The female element is basically in the lower part, along with these boats, these huge boats, and again in the upper part of light, and expanse, we have the hidden god Ammon, as well as the four-headed, uh, the main creator god, Kanum Ray. And there's the lunar disks again on the baboons and the solar disk. So this upper portion is male, having to do with light. The lower portion is the dark. The underworld, here's the four sons of Horus, yet again, with that great big uh, Hathor cow. So this is an interesting symbolism. And finally, uh, th this is too good to lose. <laughs> this is so good. This is in Schmidt's, uh, Francis Schmidt's Pista Sophia. Uh, it, this is the early Gnostic Christian view. And what he says is extremely interesting. I want to read this to you. He says, Das ersten Mysteriums befinden das vor allen Mysterien der Vater in Tauben gestalt. The first mystery, before all mysteries, is this, 
the Father in the form of a dove. He says it right there on page one in his translation of the, uh, the Gnostic Christian work, the Pistis Sophia. Now that's fantastically interesting. We know this principle of the Father in the form of a dove is at least in the early Christian idea, and we know that the idea of the deity represented as a bird is definitely an ancient Egyptian idea. Joseph Smith put those two together, and he called it the grand keywords of the priesthood. Well, what's the dove? You know, the symbolism of the dove. The one at the baptism in Jesus. It's very remarkable that we have here a combination of symbolisms. If you'll study the ancient uh, mother goddess religions, as well as the ancient religions in general, you'll find that the serpent and the dove are two very prominent mother goddess symbols. In some Gnostic circles, the dove represented the mother. Now that's fascinating. In light of Jesus' baptism, where the, the Holy Ghost descended as the form of the dove, we hear the voice of the Heavenly Father, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. We have Jesus as the Son ascending up out of the water after being baptized, and we have the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove, His mother perhaps. Beautiful family setting. Father, Mother, Son. And everyone is together as a family unit, happy as all get out, with Jesus, doing the right thing. This dove symbolism, this bird, is very important in the ancient Egyptian symbolism. And again, the grand key words of the priesthood, I can't emphasize this enough, the priesthood is about eternal lives, it is about immortality, it is about resurrection, it is about deification. There is no other power, priesthood, God's power. There is no other power in the universe following LDS theology. And let me emphasize again, too, uh, a very, it's important to understand that, that Joseph Smith here is not saying this is the true religion. No. He's saying this is the ancient Egyptian idea. Um, and Abraham himself, in the book of Abraham, is not saying this is the true religion. I'm simply giving you these figures at, at the beginning of the papyri record so that you can see what the Egyptians thought. This is how they understood things. It's not necessarily propounded as the ultimate truth. So I think it's a remarkable thing that in 18, what was it, 1835, 1836, uh, scholarship was dead to the world by then. <laughs> there wasn't anything really huge and magnificent going on in any ancient studies that we know of. The Rosetta Stone had been translated a few years prior, but it was in French. The translation, we don't know that Joseph Smith knew French. Uh, and so we have this, this cluster of symbols that Joseph Smith says is represents the grand keywords of the priesthood. It represents the father in the form of a dove, identifying the deity with a bird, etc. And he's right. Following the ancient Egyptian view, not that the real form of the Father is a bird. See, we can't concretize the symbols. If you concretize the symbols, you miss the significance of the message, the meaning, as Joseph Campbell and Mercer Eliade constantly showed. God is not literally a circle, but his life is one eternal round. The medieval uh, mystics represented God as a circle. In fact, as a circle with a triangle. Paul Foster Case, the true and secret order of the Rosicrucians, indicates that uh, very powerfully. The idea of, of uh, one eternal round. The eye of the God being our hypocephalus. Circular. Because, of course, it's a beautiful symbol of eternity because there's no beginning and no end. Unless, of course, you cut into the circle. So this idea, I think, is a pretty good match, personally. Um, now, I've gone through several Egyptological sources. I, I'm to the point where I'm asking the critics, for Pete's sake, what more can I show you? Um, you know, why don't you start looking into the Egyptologists and see what they say? I am, and what I find is very, very interesting to me, personally.